This is Julio Cotto. I'm joined by Chris Nieto and Ernesto Nieto here at the Maxwell offices at the NHI Ranch. And today we are going to spend a little bit of time talking about the 2019 summer learning theme. Uh, annually for the past almost five years, NHI introduces a theme that all of the students, the staff, the faculty, everyone engages in, in developing their leadership skills and capacities through our summer programs. Normally, the great debate students at our freshman programs will argue topics that are based around this theme. And then the older students in high school at the LDZ and the Collegiate World Series will end up using it more uh, as a thematic conversation to help them dissect uh, a lot of the learning that they're going to have at their programs. Ernesto, this year, the challenge, uh, the theme is about governance, community governance. Why this year do you believe that that is such an important, relevant theme? Julio, we've reached a time and place in history as a Latino community, due primarily in the United States to our growth and our population, our increased rates of graduation from college, our growing professional sectors, that we are now in the position to have greater presence at the governance levels of society, whether it's at local community levels, schools, whether it's in professional endeavors, whether it's in organized systems like church groups or civic groups or organizations, professional organizations. And I think it's important for young people who are going through a new era to speak of as we enter the 2020s and beyond, that they have a core concept of what governance means because there's nothing unusual. All organized societies of all kinds, authoritarian, democratic, whatever it may be, and their institutions and their organizations have structures and protocols and requirements and based on beliefs. So even families have cultures and organizational requirements and so forth. Young people don't, may not look at it that way. They may just exist within them. And yet as they get older and as they become professionalized and increase in numbers, in order for them to be effective participants at whatever level in rearing families and attending church and participate in civic organizations or governmental agencies or governmental boards and commissions of any sort, local, state, or federal, knowledge of governance is vital to any collaborative effort. For Latinos, it's vital to represent our interests and to make sure that we not only participate in decision-making towards higher goals, towards more universal needs, but more importantly, to ensure that the Latino community is well served in that process. What would you say it is in and of itself? Because I feel that even the word governance may confuse some who are going to confuse it with governing or government mm -hmm. i mean words that are similar but what is governance in and of it like in a very just simple way so that the students don't get yeah. off track it's the simple process of having a voice and role in the rule making of a body it's that simple whether it's a family whether it's a school district whether it's a societal entity it's that you have a personal role and you're relied on to contribute to that process through your knowledge and through your talents and through your expertise to make a better response, a better quality of life for others to live. When we talked about this uh, with some of our faculty uh, about a month ago, or as we've talked about it even here in the office and students, I know that you give a lot of uh, historical perspective to this concept and to this conversation about governance in the community. What would be some changes that you've seen as a community that how we approach this or even maybe disregarded it or were even unaware of governance systems that going on around us? I think that as a community, and I'm saying that with a lot of respect and a lot, a lot of humility, is that when, as Alex Ocasio once, once said, you can't be what you don't see. If you're not in a role of learning about the rules and regulations and processes that allow you to participate in decision making. When you're confronted with the opportunity or the necessity, you will not be as skillful and as competent and therefore it will have a detrimental impact on your ability to move forward, either as an individual or as an organized entity. And so as Latinos grow from being 5% less 
around 5% around 1960 to now approaching 38%, we will have larger roles in public life, but also in the private sector. We will sit on more boards and more commissions. It's very important that we understand that governance as a culture, and it's something that's vital to our development. But if, cause if we don't do that, then our voice is going to get left out. It's that simple. There is no recovering from it. I've served on various boards, and in my, in my first attempt to do it, I didn't understand all of the procedures, all of the protocols, all of the subcomponents of what governance is. I used to think it was simply policy making. No, it's not. It covers a lot of things. It covers the administration. It covers learning how to how to do budgets and learning how to distinguish between one policy and another policy and learning how to uh, gracefully enter into agreements with other people. There's a lot of collaboration in governance because you have to not only work and represent your interests, but you have to learn that you're not the only interest. It's just like this organization. If, if we're unable to take direction from our executive leadership because we agree or disagree, then we don't understand governance. The idea is to make the organization work, not to play musical chairs about who has the, more, the most power or most influence. The idea is how do you make NHI effective as an organization? How do you, how do you make that happen? How do you participate in a collaborative context? Not what is your title and what should you know? And all, oft, all, and all too many occasions, we become authoritarian with the idea of governance. I mean, we've seen these in boards. I'm a board member now. I'm here to tell you what to do. Or a parent says, this is my house. If you don't like it, leave it. And there are a lot of conflicts. So if we're not familiar with these democratic, and I don't, I don't use that in the context of politics, the collaborative, just just use that word, a collaborative approach to, to, to a unified vision of where a family is headed then you're not going to get there. It's going to get in your way. It's going to stall your efforts to progress. It's not going to allow you to utilize the talents of your, of your, of your members to their utmost. All it's going to do is stifle your, your abilities to make progress. So where would you say today the Latino community is in this, in this not a conflict or a confrontation, but in a... In an understanding of itself, where would you say the Latino community is in a, in a, in a sense of governance? Behind the times. Uh, very, very simply. And, and I know some of my friends are going to get angry at that if they hear this particular presentation. I can give you a historical context. Back in Cotula, Texas, many years ago, in the 1960s, the latter 60s, um, Latinos were not represented at all at any governance level, county government, city government, other tax, uh, public tax and law uh, uh, bodies at all. And yet Latinos were 88% of the population. So it was a kind of an apartheid, to use that word, existence. They only followed the rules that were created for them. But when they reached a level of community consciousness and they wanted to participate at a given election, all the positions that were formally or administered by non-Latinos were then administered by Latinos. Now, they had to now be the county commissioner's court, the city councils, the school boards, and so forth. And it was the absence of understanding the dynamics of governance that it became a one-on-one -on -one match. It was who hollered the loudest, who had the most support on the board, how did you lever power, and it became very authoritarian. And there for a while, there was a lot of confusion that was not to the benefit of the community because there was a huge transition taking place. And that's representative of the entire South Texas Rio Grande Valley where you can see where Latinos grew in tremendous numbers. Today, it's much more sophisticated. And today, much younger, better educated people are beginning to occupy those positions. And today, the Latino community at those levels is able to draw on more talented people to serve in those roles. But that's only a region of this country. There's L.A., you know, there's Philadelphia, there's Dallas, Houston, there's uh, Corpus Christi, there's all, there are all kinds of regions in this country where governance is lacking, and it becomes very prejudicial, one-sided, and, and you can see the impact. A great example is what voice do Latinos have in the Midwest in public education? Little to none, and yet they're fastly becoming a huge population in that five-state region.
Julio, you brought up earlier the idea, the common misconception that students think about governance as government or governing. Um, you know, you've had the opportunity to speak with thousands of kids. And here we have a program called the LDZ that really focuses on a deeper understanding of governance. Just in your years of working with students, what are some of your common, what are some of the common misconceptions students have about governance um, as they start to uh, evaluate this theme uh, moving into the summer? They <clears throat> associate governance with power, personal power. I've seen many examples at an LDZ where a governor, a newly elected governor, you know, is hollering the instructions at the cabinet. I've seen many examples at a great debate where back in the day when we had uh, an intervening opportunity, you had a commissioner, I forget exactly what the term was. Commissioner. That that was seen as the all-powerful person. And I have seen where we have a director of a great debate who interprets all of the rules as being an authority on everything that's going on. And so young kids tend to see those people with trembling legs because we've lived as Latinos in a highly authoritarian environment throughout our history. Authoritarian from populations that ruled us, or we learned bad habits from the people that ruled us. So when we became the rulers, we tended to use similar tactics, similar practices, and, and similar thinking to where it's very difficult because it becomes generational at that point. It's passed on from generation to generation. And what in fact happens is that you slow down progress and in particular innovation because people want to do the same things over and over and over because it worked for that generation. And so we have to be concerned about losing our talented kids because they're unable to fit into an authoritarian environment. If we're asking them to participate in Latino community affairs, I would rather much participate in an environment that's open and collaborative and democratic than an environment that says, well, that's the leader. Whatever he or she says, that's the way it is. And we're going to follow that right or wrong. There has to be discussion without disagreement. There has to be input for the sake of the best possible answer. So governance can easily be misinterpreted primarily by kids because they see the examples at home. A lot of them, I rule here, this is my home, and what I say goes. And we don't teach our children governance. And sometimes I think it's better for children to learn to argue. I didn't say be argumentative. I said learn to argue, defend their, their ideas through parental guidance and bring it to some conclusion and incorporate their ideas into the family practice rather than say, well, I don't agree with you, and the conversation is over. At one of our uh, ED trainings, and we were laying out the theme for the year about governance, you shared, you know, is an important component of governance is to have vision and goals because that allows the entity to begin to identify who they're going to put in place, what that structure is going to look like, what those policies are going to be needed to get there. So as students begin to explore more about the whole concept of governance, you know, what, what should students be thinking about in terms of envisioning a future um, in their role in community life? Well, there are two things that happen. If you are organized in a group, let's say a civic organization in a community, that you want to carry out a particular social good in that community, then you have to precede that with what is our vision? What is the good that's going to come from this uh, uh, proposed venture that we want to get into? And then when you define the venture, how am I going to do this is when governance comes into play. It's not before that. It's after you determine this is a vision that we want to explore and pursue. And this is these are the benefits and the good things that come from it. How we do this now becomes a venture. How we do this, what are the rules? What are the protocols? Who's involved? How do we organize it? How do we evaluate our effectiveness? All of those questions need to be answered. And it allows for collaboration. But if what we do is jump from vision to an authoritarian type structure, which is what we do a lot of times, is that we forego 
the, the examination of the venture and its component parts, and we want to get into who's driving the car, who's, who's the headmaster here, all of those terms are going to play against participation. And you may reach your vision and have no followers. So it, it's a kind of a funny dynamic. And here at NHI, I have tried through my leadership to, to create what I call a flat governance process. Now, it's not easy when people think, well, I can say whatever I want and do whatever I want, because that can be misinterpreted that way. It's very easy to misinterpret governance here in this organization. I've been given this job, and therefore I'm the only one in charge, and that's how I'm going to do it. No, it's still a team effort. It's that it lacks the hierarchical, top-down structures that we've normally seen. You had highlighted a, an example of a town, and you gave the demographics of how there was a one population of larger size and another I can feel that sometimes the conversation about Latinos and governance gets limited to just demographics. Well, there will be more of us, therefore more of us should be in governance roles or more of us should be in college. It's, it's like a very almost linear conversation. When we're asking the Collegiate World Series students this summer to talk about possible new beliefs or values that have to get proposed in the future, in, in historical context, aside from the demographics, what are some values or beliefs that you feel had to change or did change or shouldn't change? Because I feel that might be part of what the CWSers are going to have to explore as they imagine the future and what governance in the future should be like or needs to be like. If we don't expand the ground, if we don't work towards developing young people who have a more precise understanding of governance, then it becomes a process where only few will be placed in those positions. Because when I talk about governance, it's not just for the Latinos. We're going to be asked to be in governance role, just like the Texas State Legislature. And if we don't understand the nuances and the process and the complexities and, and all those things that go with it, then we're slowing down progress. We're going to be our worst enemies in the process of trying to create change. If there's something that I've learned through life, is that whatever idea I have or ideas that I may have, if I don't have the, the cooperation of someone who either supports it or I reach a compromise that if I support, they support mine, I'll support theirs. If, I, if it's me take all or the other person take all, if it's that kind of relationship, then it slows down the progress because by the time you get to that point of exchanging horses or trading horses, as they would say, it's too late. It's too many, it's too filled with potential for conflict and disagreement that has a long-term impact on the overall decision-making of an authority, now, of, a, of a structure or an entity. So governance exposure has been something that Latinos have not enjoyed in this country in the context of citizenship because we've been kept from it. We were only supposed to follow orders and abide and consent to. And the problem is twofold. We learned to believe that we weren't that important. And secondly, the end or the net impact of being in that social position was that others began to feel that we, in fact, were not competent enough. And so we were limited in the opportunities we were given because it's just a two-headed monster. If the people who can make governance possible in public entities is think that you as a Latino are not qualified, they're not going to look forward to your leadership. They may do it out of compliance for some federal law or state law, but it's not because they see the value of your representation overall. They may see your value as a Puerto Rican, dealing with the Puerto Rican community and accommodate that community in that context. But that's, you're going to be limited to that, that dead-end street. And so, therefore, you have to be very good at governance in general so that you can show you know, that, that you're competent in handling the whole concept of inclusion and participa participatory democracy and collaboration and the things that make for, and know when, when and at what place to stop the process in order to come to a decision. Sometimes the decision you want to reach does not meet the needs of all people that are part of the learning process or part of the policy process. 
but therefore you have to measure what will be the extent of the damage for future projects. And you have to be very strategic in knowing, I'm going to develop a couple of enemies maybe, or oppositional people, if I make this decision. And therefore, I need to be careful how far I take it or when I bring it forward for final decision making. You see it on our board all the time. And I watch people and how they conceptualize deal making or, or consideration of a proposal or policy. On that, in making those considerations, we're informed by some set of just beliefs or A frames or, or perspectives. And I think that, again, that's what the seniors or the rising seniors are going to have to struggle with. In your, in your context, either here at NHI or just working in the community or even in some of the work that you describe in your work with the government, what are some of these beliefs or values that had to shift in order for leadership to evolve or for the community to evolve to this next evolution? What, what values and beliefs had, came under either a conflict for you here or in the community or still exist? I'm very... Um almost rude about that. <laughs> Sometimes you have to wait for people to die. Um, when people grow up under certain perceptions, it's very difficult for them to, I was commenting to Gloria, and I'll say it here. When we talk about change in gender and gen change in gender, and gender roles in this, in this country, when I look at the TV, I see mostly white women benefiting from those changes. I don't see Latinas or African Americans to that extent. So it's like, who, do, who makes the rules and what are the implications of those rules and who's really affected by those rules that you have to evaluate? I don't know of too many Latinas that are making multi-million dollars of being the head of Google. I really don't know too many or any at all. And so what I've learned is that it's also a chess game. But here's the deal. When you play that kind of chess game, we have played from the position of need rather than the position of assets. We trade need and we get accommodated on the basis in terms of governance. We, there, we get accommodated in the process. We get a little bit of the cake, but we're never the chef. We're never the one that controls the ingredients. Somebody else does that. Somebody else really already knows inherently who's going to be the primary benefits or beneficiaries. So that's one of the real problems of governance in our society. We're going through it with the current leadership right now, is scare tactics about immigrants and all these things that are going on. It's, it's, it's frightening to what it's saying to immigrant youth, to children who go home not knowing that they're going to see their parents, to being out in public without a driver's license because you've got to go do something to shop or pay a bill. But you're an, it, it, it creates a sense of fear. So governance by fear is what I've seen, regrettably, in our society over the last two years. And uh, it's not just, and I'm not trying to make a case to change it. I'm saying it not only puts certain people, legitimizes certain things, but on the other hand, it creates a society of fear. And I see it all the time. I see it in people that I know, that they're very concerned about what's going to happen to them. So... Governance is the assurance that you have a role and a voice that's rightful and that you have the right and that you have the constitution for it and that you have the training. And that's where NHI comes in. Just take, just take the great debate. We go in with a preset structure of how things go. And I'm not criticizing the process. I'm just bringing it up. At what point do we really let the kids run the thing so that they understand governance? LDZ does the same thing. Great debate. I mean, uh, CWS does the same thing. The staff is generally in control. We might not be part of the conversation because they're go merely going through a process. We may be the ones that raise the question and that they have to answer. But everyone in that room knows who the rule makers are. Everyone in that environment knows who the rule makers are. And the rule makers are interpreted as authorities. And that's something we really have to think about. If we want someone to feel free and collaborative, how do you create that? The same thing in this organization. 
you know, if there is a concern for who makes the rules and what the retribution may be if there's not compliance, then it, it leans towards authoritarianism. And I, I try to be as open to that as I can, knowing that we still have a organizational mission to, to reach and to pursue and allow people a greater sense of engagement in the process. But just being allowed the opportunity does not give you the authority nor knowledge nor experience to in participate in a, in a governance role. A governance role merely means I have a voice and I have an influence and it's up to me to make it part of the process. It's not something that's going to be given to me. It's not going to be offered to me. It's something that I must take control of. How we accomplish that programmatically, it's a different organizational challenge. You know, Julio, we've talked about, um, whenever I've had discussions with students in, in various regions, there's a default to government. So I foresee a lot of the topics that will happen, the discussions that will happen at the Great Debate, maybe even locally, is that governance means government. And we've had discussions here at the uh, at NHI on where are various structures in which uh, we really want students to examine uh, governance. So just you know, from all all three of us here, what are some areas that we can really help students begin to look beyond government uh, as a place for governance, but where you know the great debate model at the local level there is a governance structure that happens that's available there. Um, we've talked about in the church that there is a governance structure family. There is a governance structure. What are some other examples that, you know, so we can really support all of our members in broadening their understanding of where governance can be applied. I think just kind of expanding on what you were, some of the examples you gave, there's, there's bodies and entities. Uh, you know, I think in previous conversations, we talked about the, you know, this country, at least, is made up of a variety of different communities, all intersecting and collaborating with each other, whether they're public entities, private entities, business entities, religious entities. All of them require some sort of structure or form of decision making. Um, I think right now, if you look at business, right, and you look at technology, there's a lot of conversation about what are the kind of business leaders we want in this country or who are the ones that we should listen to or model. There are some that took a big social entrepreneur type approach and how they route some of their profits to different endeavors. There, uh, there's conflict over some political um, investments that certain business leaders make that espouse that their funding espouses a political ideology and people have a problem with that. Um, the way that media is consumed and who's making these decisions about what we're consuming on TV or uh, online or, or online. Uh, you know, you brought her up earlier, uh, Alex Ocasio, the congresswoman, she made a, a decision that she was not going to engage Facebook because of what she felt, you know, it uh, from a values point of view. And she made a decision to operate on other media platforms. So I think even there's just a governance of your own decision making about what you choose to consume, what you choose to operate off of. Um, I had an alum ask us, ask me the other day what kind of server was NHI using? And the question was not so much about a technology, about efficiency and chips. It was about certain servers in this country being associated with companies that have made certain maybe questionable or negative decisions in the world. And that, that may impact communities. Yeah, and, and if we're a nonprofit that has values about the community and ethics and morals and being asset-based, are, are even our technological computer server decisions reflective of those values. Uh, it's a very small example, maybe a little too detailed, but those are the kind of questions that I think right now, because of the social media world and the high levels of communication, that all decisions are being called into question or being evaluated. And I think that that's why governance is important beyond government, because it's even about how you govern your own life mm -hmm. and your own decisions and how you discriminate between... Do I buy this? Do I buy that? Do I read this? Do I read that? Do I support this? Do I not? Um, and even being silent 
is taken as a decision more so. You're 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 refraining from engaging in and of itself is seen as a decision. Uh, so I think that a lot of all our decisions are part of how we govern ourselves or how we would govern in a, in a position of leadership. Um, and I think we're in a very interesting climate where all of it is being evaluated, maybe too much. You know, you talked about Alex and just examining her own values and how she's going to govern herself. And that really provides real guidance to her staff and how they will operate. You know, I think one area for students this year is to really begin to examine those particular core values about, um, about themselves, about their community. You talked earlier about perceptions of, of the mental models. We've often talked a lot about the mental models that they have of, uh, of governance. Is it one of authoritative or is it one of being collaborative, inclusive? Um, you know, so as we move forward and looking at students to really self-examine areas in which they value and beginning to, in their own mental models, in their own perceptions of governance and authority, and walking into the summer and using this as a playground to, uh, you know, challenge, you know, others' ideas and really share out and defend their own ideas. So, there are any other examples that you would? Yeah, I just wanted to bring out that to, to at least from my point of view, governance deals with the how-tos of policy. You know, what are the policy needs that we have here and how are we going to go about this, right? Embedded in that mission, attempt to define mission or social good or whatever we want to call it, is a how are we going to go about this? That's when you see either lazy fair approaches or there's everybody's involved but no one's really in charge or you may see highly authoritarian or you may see people who don't want to get involved or part of it, but don't want to be criticized. And so they're very timid about having any involvement at all. That's where, they see, where you see the human behaviors come out. Um, that's where you see interpretive stuff come out, like who do we go to for help instead of how do we help ourselves? Uh, NHI and its, and, its, and its mission to expand the supply of future community leaders. Is it because there is a need or is it because there is an opportunity? Uh, to me, that's a very important distinction. If, if we say because there is a need, which was suggested a minute ago, then everything we do is driven by a void, something that we're not capable of doing on our own. But if it's done because we see opportunity and we can become compelling and convincing that we have huge untapped sources of human potential, then that drives the mindset of the policies we want to follow. And so we have to be analytical about these things. And I know that when people come to work here, they come with a, the mindset of pursuing, of energy directed at correcting something or pursuing need. We don't have enough of, we, we are being mistreated. And I'm not saying those things are not real in the lives of people. They are real. But someone who controls and mobilizes and controls resources does not recognize need very well because they're more focused on what to do with the resources they're able to tap or have accumulated and get dividends from that. And it doesn't have to be monetary dividends. It can be human dividends. And so we have to be very, you know, if, if we do our program, if a kid proposes something at the LDZ, is it to address a need or to further an asset and make sense of that asset and make sense of what the proposal is? If a kid is arguing at the great debate, are they arguing a need or an asset? And are, is that what they're arguing? And if we do a case, it's because there's is there obstruction in terms of ideology that that what we perceive what we're perceiving here is something that's in our way or something we're not doing well enough because we do have the potential and so there are very discrete distinctions that have to be made to the kids and to the CWSers 
Because I can guarantee you that we have been historically a community that's been dealt with or has learned to accept human need as our core, as our core deficiency and the inability to address our own core needs that we have mainly concentrated around in our, in our community efforts. Both of you, uh, what are some things? So the great debaters we know are going to have the opportunity to examine this from multiple sides. That's part of the game is looking at all sides of an argument. Um, and they're going to explore that. LDZers ears are going to have to, they're going to be in the situation where they have to outline their own beliefs and their own uh, values or, and the decisions that they're going to inform their how to. Um, and then the CWS is going to have to think about the future and really examine if they want a, a desired future, what are the decisions that they're going to have to make or the decision makers in place? What are some final questions you think uh, you want to leave with the students or families listening about uh, to think in preparation for the co summer conversation? From my point of view, I want every kid to know two things. That the reason they're selected by NHI is because of the human potential, not because they need something. We already know they're winners. We already know they're capable. That's number one. Probably the most difficult transition for them is how to translate that, that potential into asset building in the Latino community rather than be driven by, I'm here to champion a cause in behalf of the Latino community. And, and it's the first one that's very difficult for them because it's more, I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't come up with a term, it's easier for them to see themselves as champions than to say to themselves, what do I do to increase the asset? This was my thinking this morning on the way to NHI. Here are the assets we have. Here are the things we've accomplished. This is a ground we, we covet. This is a theory. How do we make it bigger and better? What are some innovative ways to achieve new parts of our vision? Not, we don't have enough staff. We don't charge enough. Life's gotten too expensive. All of those things that get in our way of how we do things could have occupied all of my time coming to Maxwell. But I'm still searching, and it's going to take me some time, to take a look at the asset capacities of our community and learn how to cultivate that into something better. You know, in my response, every time I have an opportunity to meet new students, prospective NHI students, I share from the get-go that we have a core fundamental belief that these students have the potential to shape entire communities. It's just that the core of what we believe is that they are our most valuable assets in our community. And, you know, as any student going through the great debate, LDZ or CWS, is looking beyond the theme as just something merely to discuss at the program, but really understanding that this is one of the requirements to be influencers and shapers of an entire community is to truly understand the concepts of governance and their role in uh, community life and in shaping entire communities. And so, you know, I'll be working a lot with the great debate this summer. And my hope is that the students engage in intellectual discussions um, so that they better understand other points of view. They gain greater clarity in their understanding of governance as they're learning this so that they can go back to their communities and begin to uh, uh, be the influencers in the community shapers that we believe they are. I think my only uh, two cents, uh, final two cents, are uh, to the students out there listening to this and coach, uh, ask your parents, talk, sit and have a conversation with your grandparents, your aunts and uncles this weekend or whenever you're listening to this on the way. Uh, what is their take on governance? You know, governance in their neighborhood, in their town, in their HOA. Ask them what are some of the things that they look to or the evaluation they do about what they see as good governance, sound governance, um, and engage engage the conversation with your community and your family before we see you this summer, uh, where we'll definitely be looking forward to, to carrying this out. Thank you, Chris Nieto, Ernesto Nieto, and I am Julio Cotto here from the uh, NHI Ranch in Maxwell, Texas, and we look forward to continuing this conversation 
uh, with the hundreds of students out there at all the programs this coming summer and our alumni and members and trainers um, as we just work to continue developing future leaders for our communities. Thank you. For more information on the National Hispanic Institute, please visit our website, www.nationalhispanicinstitute.org. Call us at 512-357-6137. Find us on Facebook at NHIHQ or on Twitter, NHI underscore news and at Instagram and Snapchat, NHI underscore news. Thank you to Union Pacific for their generous support as a sponsor of the NHI Podcast Network. Music by Andres Cotto.